Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, good afternoon to our Middle Eastern participant, European and African. Uh, good morning to those that are joining us from North and South America. And I want uh, to have a special thank you to the three speakers that are going that join us today. Uh, so welcome to UNIDIR, the Middle East Weapon of Mass Destruction Free Zone Project launch event uh, of the essay series from the Iran nuclear deal to the Middle East uh, zone, the Weapon of Mass Destruction Free Zones lesson learned. The series is now available online and our very capable event producer, uh, Leticia, will post the link to the report if you have not received it yet. You will see it in the chat box um, to your right. Uh, to those that uh, are not familiar with our program, uh, it was launched in October 2019 with the support and funding from the European Union. The project is aimed to fill uh, four different objectives. The first is to fill research gaps on the evolution of the zone, to build capacity, to, de to develop new ideas and foster dialogue. If you missed our document depository, which is an online comprehensive resource hub on the evolution of the Middle East Weapon of Mass Destruction Free Zone uh, up to date, the collection includes over 400 documents from open sources and private collections. Several of the documents have never been published before, and we are very proud uh, to have them with uh, posted them. So I encourage you to visit uh, the depository, and Leticia also will post uh, the link to that in the chat box. One of the few positive aspects of the global pandemic uh, is our ability to bring more people together. And as you will see, uh, more and more will join us in the next couple of minutes. Where, but it's pretty remarkable that uh, I'm pretty, and I'm particularly happy that we have on the line many participants from the region, as well as from uh, the diplomatic communities in Geneva, New York, and Vienna. Uh, and before I turn the floor to Unidir Director, uh, our speaker uh, and our speakers, couple of housekeeping items. So please note that the event is recorded and is on the record, and we have a couple of journalists on the line. Uh, the default of all your videos and mics uh, are off, but if you want to ask a question, please do so in the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you have uh, any technical questions about it, uh, Leticia posted her um, email and that and you can email her with specific technical questions we will also uh if you're if you have a question and uh you will have then the opportunity to, to turn your camera and mic on when you're called to ask your question uh we hope to accommodate as many questions as possible uh leticia also put um in um uh, in the chat box additional information about the process of the q a with that, uh, let me first present uh, for opening remark, UNIDIR Director, Dr. Uh, Robin Geis. Dr. Geis has uh, joined us uh, about a month and a half ago, and we are very, very pleased to have him. Uh, he has close to 20 years of experience in peace and security with focus on the impact of new technologies. Most recently, he served as Director of the Glasgow Center for International Law and Security at the University of Glasgow, and uh, as the Swiss Chair of International Humanitarian Law with the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Humanitarian Rights. He's visiting professor also at the Paris School of International Affairs and Sciences Po in Paris. So uh, with that, Robin, the mic is yours. Thank you, Ren, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, also from my side. It's uh, a real pleasure to publicly launch uh, the essay series today from the Iran nuclear deal to the Middle East zone Lessons from the JCPOA for the Middle East WMB Free Zone, uh, which has been edited, of course, by our project lead, Dr. Ken Zak, and researcher, Dr. Farzan Sabet. And I'm truly delighted also to welcome today a distinguished panel of experts and former officials to discuss this essay series. It's my first time uh, attending a Middle East WMB Free Zone uh, event uh, since assuming the directorship uh, of Minidir in April this year. Uh, and it's really heartwarming uh, to see so many people attending the event and the level of seniority of regional and international diplomats and experts. It's a clear demonstration of the timeliness of the topic, the timeliness of the publication and the event and the commitment of this community to better understanding what's in the realm of the possible, what's in the realm of the desirable to promote non-proliferation, disarmament and security in the region. Now, first of all, I want to thank the EU for its generous support of the Middle East WMB Free Zone project and acknowledging uh, the attendance of Ambassador Marjolaine uh, van Delen, the EU Special Envoy for Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. 
the European Union's dedication in promoting regional security in the Middle East in general, support of the Middle East WMD free zone idea, and spearheading the current constructive negotiations around the restoring the full implementation of the JCPOA in Vienna demonstrate the important role of the EU that the EU continues to play in promoting global <clears throat> and regional non-proliferation. Now, the talks between China, France, Germany, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Iran to restore the joint comprehensive plan of action are in a critical phase at the moment, and we wish all the negotiators good luck in this complex negotiation. I also want to congratulate Iran and the IAEA for reaching an agreement to extend the verification arrangements between the two of them by a month. I think that'll give the negotiators in Vienna essential space to continue intense discussions. Now, as indicated by the name of the publication we're discussing today, the objective of the essay series really is to identify and develop topics in the JCPOA applicable to the Middle East WMD free zone, and to identify important distinctions that future zone negotiators may wish to keep in mind. Now, while it's clear uh, that the two agreements are not the same and that they have very distinct objectives, a distinct scope and a distinct membership, and that of course the JCPOA includes a provision stating explicitly it should not be considered as setting precedents for any other state or for fundamental principles of international law, learning from the JCPOA experience could still be a valuable experience for the Middle Eastern states. Now, uh, the JCPO's unique negotiating process, uh, unique provisions and implementation created an important set of tools that could provide valuable insights and lessons for a Middle East WMD free zone. And Farzan, uh, in a moment, will elaborate uh, in more detail about these broader findings. In addition to our research findings, of course, with this project, we aimed also to facilitate exchange and dialogue among diverse experts in the debate on the JCPOA and the Middle East WMD free zone. And secondly, to build regional capacity and enhance the Middle East WMD free zone project network of experts. To achieve these two purposes, the project team held a smaller event among the essay authors and experts in October 2020 to discuss and develop the ideas uh, as discussed. The SS series we're launching today brought together a diverse set of authors from JCPOA participants. And the essays uh, uh, focus on five different themes. The negotiation process, structure and format, the nuclear fuel cycle activities and research, civil nuclear cooperation, nuclear monitoring safeguards and verification, and compliance and enforcement. Now I'm looking forward to continuing to engage with all of you and please, uh, and also, of course, to fruitful discussions today. And please let me apologize in advance that I will not be able to stay for the entirety of the event today uh, for the reason of another previously scheduled commitment. Well, with that, I wish you fruitful discussions once again. And over to you, uh, Hen, the mic is uh, back with you. Thank you, Robin. And uh, with that, with no further ado, let me uh, turn to our first four distinguished speakers. So. First, we'll start with uh, our own uh, Dr. Farzan Sabat, uh, a researcher with our project uh, that led the research initiative as well. And Farzan will present uh, the essay series and some of our findings and discuss some of the cross-cutting themes and insight from the five essays uh, in the series. So with that, Farzan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Ken. I'd like to begin by thanking the authors of this series who worked incredibly hard on their essays and had to incorporate an enormous amount of feedback um, and endure many grueling rounds of edits for the series of this size. I would also like to thank the 12 reviewers as well as the larger Unity team who gave critical but constructive feedback and support at, at key junctures, um, inclu including at the closed door event that uh, Robin mentioned in October, 2020. Um, I'm also happy to see that many of the authors, reviewers, and members of the larger Unity or family can join us today to see the seeds of our labor come to fruition. Now, with that said, um, this series is the, pro is the product of over nine months of effort. Although I went into it with a strong foundation on both the JCPOA and the Middle East WMD free zone, the act of thinking of some of the cross thematic categories that would apply in both instances comparing and contrasting the two processes, and then synthesizing some of the common ideas across the essays has helped me gain a deeper understanding of both. Uh, 
Given that the foundation of this series and individual essays is a reflection on the 12 plus years negotiating process and five years plus implementation history of the JCPOA uh, and their application to the Middle East WMD Free Zone, I think the lessons from these essays operated on at least two levels. First, as they apply to the negotiation and implementation of a future zone treaty or agreement. And I think second, perhaps uh, to help us think through uh, the future of the JCPOA itself. Um, with that said, in my brief time, I'd like to focus on three of the cross uh, thematic insights in the essay series, which my co-editor Fenzak and I have laid out in the introductory essay uh, of the series. These are, there are of course many more, and I encourage you to read the publication itself to, to discover them. But I thought it'd be useful to emphasize these three as a starting point for uh, our discussion. Now, the first uh, cross thematic theme I'd like to discuss is the structure, uh, incentive structure to reach the JCPOA versus a zone. One of the major distinctions between the JCPOA and the zone processes has been the vastly different power dynamics between their respective participant states. The JCPOA comprised of six of the world's most powerful states, including five with nuclear weapons and UN Security Council vetoes, as well as the EU on one hand versus Iran on the other, with clear asymmetries in their political, economic, and military capacities. Given the disparity in both power and the agreement's objectives, each side committed uh, to different obligations. Iran accepted a range of restrictive measures on its nuclear program, some of which would expire over time, while the E3 EU plus three committed to sanctions lifting and peaceful nuclear cooperation. This disparity has been a defining feature um, of the nuclear negotiations and JCPOA, but is largely absent from the zone context. While indeed different states in the region possess different conventional WMD capabilities, under the zone, all states will, at the end of the day, undertake identical obligations. Uh, in fact, I think the stated objective of the zone is explicitly to ensuring that no state in the region possesses WMDs. Now, the essays by Mr. Robert Einhorn, Dr. Dina Svendieri, and Professor Gregor Mallard and myself acknowledge the importance of this power disparity in the JCPOA. It formed part of the intricate mix of carrots and sticks that created political will and urgency for the E3, EU plus three, and Iran to negotiate, reach a compromise, and abide by it on an ongoing basis. I think this in incentive structure doesn't really exist in the case of the zone, precisely because of its nature, with all members having nominally equal status as well as obligation. The question I think we have to ask ourselves is that um, will or should sticks or pressure, either by regional or extra regional states, play a bigger role in the future to make the zone more likely? Now, I I'm personally skeptical of the long-term efficacy of a largely pressure-centric approach as we saw with the JCPOA. And moreover, I think the reality in the region as it exists now is that there's not much stakes or pressure for states uh, of the region to negotiate and join a zone. Therefore, and especially keeping in mind some of the trends in the region which point to the possible increasing likelihood of WMD proliferation and use, I think we have to think more along the lines of what carrots or incentives regional states have to develop or be offered to negotiate and join a Middle East WMD free zone. In a zone context, uh, as things stand today in the region, no regional state can compel others to compromise, but instead must offer compromises, which they may not be wholly satisfied with, to get them in return. Now, the second cross thematic um, issue I'd like to highlight is compartmentalization and its relationship with the issue of regional security. Uh, in her essay on the JCPOA negotiation process, structure, and format, Dr. Esfandari noted that compartmentalization of E3 EU plus three Iran nuclear negotiations was crucial to facilitate progress in the negotiations. By focusing mainly on the Iran nuclear program and relief of associated sanctions, progress could be made in these talks despite the differences between the two sides and other areas. Applying this lesson to the zone, uh, she states that compartmentalizing discussions on the zone will also be key to ensuring progress can be made. Otherwise, talks will be impeded by tensions and disagreements that already plague the Middle East and any potential additional sources of conflict that may arise. However, I think several authors also point out that tensions around the Middle East regional conflicts and security have also been one of the factors that have arguably dragged down the Iran nuclear deal. Many in the United States and the Middle East view the absence of attention to regional security issues outside of the nuclear domain as a major omission 
from the process that led to the JCPOA. And this may in fact have been one of the deal's weak points which contributed to the decision of President Donald J. Trump, backed by several regional states, to withdraw from the JCPOA and reimpose harsh sanctions on Iran. The absence of attention to regional security in past efforts to create a zone has also contributed to the decision by some states to not negotiate or engage in consultations and negotiations. Therefore, moving forward, we have to think more carefully about how to modulate the objective scope and participants in the Middle East WMD free zone process to make success in negotiations possible while also creating agreements that are durable in the long term. And, and I think this also applies to the case of the JCPOA that is currently in the process of being reinstated and any future um, addendums that the participants may want to contemplate. This means we should identify ways to address regional security issues that work in tandem with and enable and support uh, both the Iran nuclear deal and regional WMD talks. The final, I think, cross thematic issue that I'd like to discuss is a possible JCPOA uh, regionalization. Um, well, as Robin noted earlier, the JCPOA includes a provision stating it should not be considered as setting a precedent for any other states or for fundamental principles of international law. The essay series, I think, seriously examines what can be learned from the Iran nuclear deal for its own in the sense of viewing some of the elements of the JCPOA as being possibly applicable or, in some instances, uh, that should be avoided in its own context. For example, uh, Mr. Ein Robert Einhorn, uh, Anton Klopkov, and Andreas Bersbo raised some specific cases uh, from the uh, essays, which, which, you know, some proposals. Um, now, given the time constraints uh, we have, I'll just mention a few here. One example is applying the ban on plutonium facility construction and material production to the broader Middle East, uh, expanding uh, Iranian on obligations under Section T. Uh, these are related to the development of nuclear explosive devices. Um, with, and which are enforced in perpetuity to the entire region, making the additional protocol a baseline component of a zone monitoring safeguards and verification framework. And finally, taking certain civil nucle nuclear cooperation projects contemplated or proposed in the context of the JCPOA and applying them on a regional or sub-regional basis. And the examples could include uh, cooperation and in institution building around issues such as um, nuclear medicine, safety and security. It should be noted that the JCPOA, if it survives, may serve as a bridge to a Middle East zone in terms of principles and specific elements that are already being implemented in Iran and the region today. And if it doesn't survive, I think we can always consider adapting some of the elements the authors identified in their essays for the zone. Some of these aspects have also uh, been contemplated by Ambassador Hussein Musevian and Mr. Ahmad Kiai in their recent book on the zone. And I believe Mr. Fahmi has also written on the subject and I'm sure will elaborate on this in his talk. Uh, thank you very much. And I look forward to both hearing the other speakers and engaging with audience questions. Thank you. Thank you, Farzan. And our next speaker will concentrate on the essay series as well as possible value for policymakers, experts, and uh, researchers. So with that, it's uh, my honor to introduce Mr. Uh, Mark Fitzpatrick. Mark is an associate fellow and former executive director of IISS Americas, uh, and is a temporary managing uh, the non-proliferation and nuclear policy program at IISS. So with that, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Han, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for inviting me. Uh, this isn't the first time that you uh, tried to get me involved in this project, uh, but as they say, uh, one can uh, run but not hide. I salute the uh, optimism of the organizers when they initiated this project and then when they scheduled the event, uh, they, I guess, expected that there would be a JCPOA from which to draw lessons. And thankfully, there still is. The Trump administration did everything it could to try to kill uh, the deal. And Iran's response uh, made some assume that the JCPOA uh, was indeed dead. But it's, it survived uh, in a coma, and it's now being resuscitated. Uh, 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 one apology um, on a personal basis. As I speak to you from Washington, D.C., you may hear a chorus of cicadas outside. It's impossible to shut them off. Last week, um, uh, the last time I was in a, speaking in a webinar panel, I, I did so from my car with the windows rolled up, and that was not so comfortable. Now, um, after the JCPOA was signed six years ago, I wrote a commentary about the dozen ways I thought that the Iran deal promoted global disarmament and non-proliferation. I went back and read it in preparation for this event. And 
not all of the lessons I saw then are directly applicable to a zone in the Middle East free of weapons of mass destruction, and some were overtaken by events. But here are six lessons that I've updated that I think do apply. And these are all, I think, positive lessons. Um, the JCPOA history also has many cautionary tales that led to lead to pessimism about establishing a zone. But I want to try to be as positive as possible today. So the big lesson, number one, is that multilateral diplomacy can work. Uh, the JCPOA showed the value of diplomacy, of multilateral diplomacy. You know, back in 2012, before talks got underway in earnest, um, there were legitimate fears that Iran would either uh, get the bomb quickly or would be bombed trying to get it. And the deal averted both of those worst case outcomes. The major powers worked well together in negotiating the deal in, 20, in 2015 and in negotiating restoration this year. Inspections, resolutions, incentives and disincentives all played an important role employed to good effect by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Security Council, and the E3 EU plus three, uh, as far as on uh, outlined. Um, the mechanics of international institutions can often be cumbersome and inefficient. Um, in producing the JCPOA though, multilateral diplomacy had one of its finest hours. And this, is no, this was no small accomplishment, you know, given the animosity between the United States and Russia, the United States and, and China, the United States and Iran. Um, establishing a zone uh, free of WMD in the Middle East will require a similar shared sense of purpose among the major powers a willingness to work together. Now, a flip side to this lesson is that diplomacy can get derailed when one key party pulls out. If there ever is to be a, a WMD a free zone in the Middle East, um, it will take constant nurturing and preservation. You know, um, the, the Western negotiators uh, to the Iran deal tried to protect it from derailment by building in a snapback uh, sanctions mechanism in the event of significant Iran violations. They never expected that one of their own number, the United States, would be the uh, first violator. A uh, second lesson is that disarmament can be consistent with national security needs. I don't want to overstate the case, but the JCPOA did show that states can agree verifiably to reduce um, enriched uranium holdings and to accept intrusive verification without loss to their security their sovereignty, or their self-respect. Now, the time-limited nature of the limits on Iranian enrichment uh, make this an imperfect lesson for a zone, uh, which presumably would be permanent. But some aspects of the JCPOA do not expire. I think the enrichment limits in the JCPOA will have to be extended, at least in order to recapture the time that was lost while Iran was not abiding by the limits and really beyond that. Extending the time when Iran's pathways to a nuclear weapon are blocked may make it marginally more possible for Israel to accept limits on its nuclear program. The JCPOA arguably reduced uh, incentives for others in the region to seek the weapons option. In the absence of a deal that uh, reversed Iran's march toward de facto nuclear weapon status, Saudi Arabia uh, made it clear, and possibly other states uh, would have had a motivation to seek nuclear capabilities. Third big lesson is the importance of strong verification. The JCPOA reinforced the norm of the IAEA additional protocol and went beyond it to include monitoring of the procurement chain, um, monitoring of centrifuge production and storage, and monitoring of all uranium ore concentrate. That's a useful precedent for any other non-proliferation deals, including uh, WMD free zone. The IAEA is also using the most modern safeguards techniques, uh, such as online environmental, um, online um, en enrichment monitoring. And, and that really should be the norm for any elsewhere in the world. 
the dispute resolution process in the JCPOA added a, a deadline to what had been an open-ended process of complementary access in um, the additional protocol. It improved upon it. And the procurement channel, uh, which regulates uh, Iranian nuclear imports, I think should be extended to a region-wide basis, as Bob Einhorn suggests in, the, uh, in his essay. Strength and verification is vital because, look, if Israel is ever to relax its guard and give up nuclear weapons, there will need to be deeply intrusive verification measures uh, elsewhere to, to give Israel assurance that potential adversaries are not cheating. Uh, a fourth um, small lesson, maybe I should have mentioned this earlier when I was talking about the snapback uh, mechanism. I think that's a useful precedent. It was really new in the JCPOA. It gave parties confidence that uh, a violation uh, would not go unpunished, but <laughs> it needs to be applicable to all parties, not just, uh, not just to the, the one seen as the adversary. A fifth lesson, um, it's, it's useful to go beyond the a narrow reading of the NPT. The JCPOA was NPT plus in several ways. Um, in section T, it banned several activities useful to the development of nuclear weapons, including computer models to uh, simulate nuclear explosive devices and uh, design of multi-point explosive detonator uh, systems. You know, none of these are necessary for civil nuclear energy production, but they're all uh, important uh, for nuclear weapons. Let's ban them, um, and not just uh, in Iran. I think it's regretful that uh, Russia has blocked confirmation of an IAEA role in verifying these restrictions. It should be recognized that the IAEA has both a right and a responsibility beyond the Iran case to verify nuclear weaponization work that doesn't necessarily include nuclear material. Um, as Russia argues that only if it includes nuclear material does it fall under the IAEA uh, ambit. The JCPOA uh, constraints on enrichment and reprocessing also go beyond the um, MPT, of course, uh, although the limits are, are time bound. These time-bound limits should be extended, as I said, and, and I think the reprocessing limit can be made permanent um, since Iran has no plutonium reprocessing. It's always easier to give up something that you don't have. And look, no state in the region uh, has um, plutonium reprocessing, to my knowledge. So uh, that, I think, can be a component of the Middle East nuclear weapons free zone um, since states would give up something they don't already have. Uh, and, and by the way, Iran would be more likely to extend it indefinitely if the ban applied to other states or there was a prospect of that. And my last lesson six is um, narrow the problem set. In her essay, my former um, IISS colleague, Dina Esfandiari, notes that uh, compartmentalization of the JCPOA negotiations was crucial, focusing only on the nuclear issue. Negotiations would have been vastly overcomplicated had they included all the other issues of concern, including missiles, Iran's uh, regional activity, and other matters. Now, uh, the, G, the, the zone uh, definition, the zone goal by definition is far more expansive. Uh, you know, it's all WMD in the region, uh, and, and some say missiles as well. Um, I'm not optimistic that a zone can be negotiated with this all encompassing uh, goal. I rather agree with Bob Einhorn's cautious, caution about an all or nothing approach. Um, it's not surprising I agree with Bob. He was my mentor at the State Department. Uh, some elements of the zone are much more in reach. You know, really, I think they're, they're possible. I, I wouldn't call them necessarily low hanging fruit, but. Uh, there's more, it's more possible. And I would direct efforts toward um, those that are more possible, including a region-wide adherence to the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, to the Chemical Weapons Convention, to the IAEA Additional Protocol, and to a ban on plutonium reprocessing. And in this uh, respect, I think I echo some of the themes of the essays, but uh, not all of them. I do encourage everyone to read them um, as I look forward to reading them in more depth. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. And with that, uh, I have a special honor today to have uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Gauk, uh, Mrs. Sorry, Gauk Karamukhojanova, uh, the Director of International Organization and Non-Proliferation Program at the Vienna Center for Non-Proliferation, for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Gaukar, uh, I don't think your gender is in question, so sorry for that, but uh, the mic is yours. Thank you, Hen. Um, you never know, I often get addressed as Mr. In, uh, in, in, in emails from people who never met me, so it's, uh, it's not a particularly new phenomenon. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening <laughs> to, to everybody, and thank you so much to, to, to you, Hen, to uh, Farzan, to Unidir for involving me in this fascinating discussion. Um, uh, like uh, like Mark, I managed to escape the first time around, but, uh, but here I am <laughs> in the second phase. Um, and I would like to also thank all of the contributing authors. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed reading the essays. It's indeed an excellent collection, uh, thought-provoking and rich in information and, and analysis, uh, both for those interested in the JCPOA in particular and, and, and in the zone more broadly. And it certainly won't be possible to comment on everything that I, I found interesting or important during, during this webinar. So by all means, um, the, the participants do, do check out the essays themselves. So, so um, speaking today, I would concentrate on, on a couple of issues, uh, uh, those being some aspects of uh, verification lessons, uh, fuel cycle restrictions, and, and the structure of the negotiations themselves. And these topics are covered in the essays by Andreas Pejbo, uh, Robert Einhorn, and Dr. Dines von Diary, respectively. And to start with verification, um, Andreas begins his, his essay uh, reviewing the verification provisions in the JCPOA, which, uh, as he describes, consists of three levels. The Comprehensive Safeguards Agreement, uh, which, of course, Iran has pursuant to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, the Additional Protocol, which Iran is now in the no longer implementing provisionally, but was at the time of writing. And, um, and then additional measures that are pursuant specifically uh, to, to the Iran deal itself. And one of the early conclusions in the essay um, is that most verification monitoring under the JCPOA uh, really rests on the existing instruments, the, the, the pre-existing instruments, the, the CSA and the additional protocol. Uh, and that the combination of these two uh, would be the logical sort of minimum verification standard for, for the zone when it is negotiated. Because it is this combination of the CSA and additional protocol uh, is what allows the, the IEA to draw a so-called broad conclusion uh, that all the nuclear material in a state remains in peaceful uses, right? That there's no diversion of declared material and there is no undeclared material. So I, I fully share that, uh, that early Conclusion, and I think it's worth noting that one of the currently existing nuclear weapon free zones, uh, the one in Central Asia, already requires comprehensive safeguards agreement and additional protocol as the verif verification standard for its states parties. So it's not, so it's, it wouldn't be a revolutionary requirement of any kind for, for the Middle East uh, zone to adopt that as well. Um, but things certainly get more complicated when we look at the measures, um, the JCPOA specific measures that go uh, beyond the additional protocol. Uh, and the Iran deal does demonstrate that concerns in particular about potential undeclared activities, uh, clandestine routes to fissile material production past uh, weaponization activities, all require some measures going beyond the toolbox that we have already under the additional protocol. And, uh, and as Andreas notes, while the JCPOA text specifically says it shouldn't be taken as precedent for, uh, for verification activities elsewhere, uh, nothing should prevent other agreements and other negotiators from drawing on the JCPOA experience and, and provisions in, um, in crafting enhanced verification for, for other negotiations in the future. And given in particular the levels of mistrust in the region and uh, the various histories of nuclear activities, uh, the negotiating states might find additional reporting and monitoring of, uh, let's say, the front end of the fuel cycle, like the JCPOA does, desirable. Um, monitoring of and product, uh, monitoring and verification of production and storage of centrifuge parts is another JCPOA feature that could also be uh, considered by the negotiators. Uh, but whatever additional measures the zonal parties might consider, 
Uh, those, of course, will have to be commensurate with the actual terms of the zone and its prohibitions. Uh, and this is where we come to the interesting question of capability limitations, right? There's no need to monitor production of centrifuges if you, you know, don't have any enrichment in, in the region. Um, and that's the question that Bob Einhorn addresses in, in his essay. Um, he, he looks at the uh, JCPOA constraints on fissile material production in Iran, as well as research uh, and development activities, and discusses how those limitations could be applicable to, to the future zone in the Middle East. And the ideal scenario, both for Iran, in the case of Iran, and, and the zone in general, as Bob's essay suggests, uh, would be to eliminate existing and, and ban any future enrichment and, and reprocessing. Um, however, as he himself points out, and I fully agree, uh, an important lesson, not only from the JCPOA itself, but from basically all of the developments in Iran's nuclear program and negotiations since 2006, strongly suggests that once it, it acquires it, the state is highly, highly unlikely to give up a capability such as enrichment completely. Furthermore, states will be reluctant to completely give up even a potential future capability like, let's say, in processing. So even though uh, at the moment, in the context of uh, actual fissile material production in the Middle East, we're really talking about only Iran and Israel, uh, a complete ban on FISMAT production in the zone is almost certainly off, off the table. Uh, and so, again, drawing on the JCPOA experience, what would be more realistic for the future zone is to impose certain constraints short of a complete prohibition on, on fiscal material production. Um, Bob Einhorn goes into sort of both sides of the argument here, uh, suggesting on the one hand that, that uh, limitations would be useful, but also raising the concern that uh, permitting enrichment with limitations would somehow legitimize enrichment in the region um, and, and allow states to develop certain low uh, limited scale capabilities that they might then use if they choose to, to withdraw from the agreement. Um, I would slightly disagree here with, this, with this, uh, this, this latter argument because, again, dealing with the situation we currently have, given that there are no limitations on enrichment and reprocessing under uh, either the NPT or any of the existing nuclear free zones, uh, plus the realities again of, of, of the capabilities in the region, we're not really looking at a choice between whether to allow or not allow this material production, but rather do we completely allow it like the NPT does, or we try to negotiate some kind of uh, material uh, limitations on, on the capabilities. And I think it's, um, it's worth looking into that latter uh, option, again, drawing on the lessons from, from the JCPOA. Um, a challenge that comes up with it, of, with the capability caps, is um, that of time constraints. So restrictions on Iran under the JCPOA have famously have time limits, right? That's all the criticism about the sunset clauses. Um, certainly permanent restrictions on, on, on capabilities are more preferable from the non-proliferation perspective, as, as Bob Einhorn points out. Uh, but they are also, I think, more logical from a negotiating perspective if we're talking about having that as part of the, of the zonal negotiation, because uh, it becomes very difficult to, to somehow pick the timelines, not for one country, but for a whole region, and how do you justify those, those different kinds of uh, uh, time, limit, time limitations. Uh, Andreas Persbro also goes into this issue in his essay. He discusses uh, in this regard the concept of the breakout time that guided the negotiations on, on Iran's program limitations. Uh, but he doesn't suggest an answer necessary about how to, to calculate something like that uh, for the zone. So the lesson I would draw is that try to have capability limitations and most certainly try to have them without any time limit, sort of as long as the zone is in place. Going back to Andreas and verification, um, I'd like to highlight arguably the trickiest and most sensitive issue that came up already uh, in this webinar, and that is the question of past military uh, and weaponization activities. Uh, Andreas discusses the weaponization and IE verification needs in this regard. He goes into quite some detail. So again, please uh, look, at the, look at the essay if you're interested in the subject. Um, and it's worth remembering that an IA conclusion about Iran's past weaponization activities was one of the prerequisites for the JCPOA 
implementation date to go into effect and for the sanctions lifting to begin. Um, so on the one hand, it provided incentives for Iran to cooperate and provide answers. On the other hand, it put some pressure on the IEA itself to come up with a conclusion by that sort of uh, half self-imposed, half agreed deadline of December 2015. And so once the IEA came up with that conclusion, some experts and member states have criticized it for uh, possibly drawing conclusion on having incomplete information. And, and, and probably the agency would have liked to have more answers and more details. But at the time, the technical secretariat judged that they got enough to provide assurance. And so in discussing the issue of past weaponization activities, Andreas underscores that the IA certainly doesn't need to go into every little bit of detail of every activity. Um, and the idea behind clarification on weapons on the past activities and weaponization is not to you know, get the state to come clean and fall on its knees and beg for forgiveness, but rather to provide assurance that you know, all the material is now in peaceful uses and is not, uh, is not diverted. So in the context of the Middle East zone negotiations, this will be of quite some importance, uh, not only and not so much because of Iran, but certainly because of Israel. Uh, and there, the, the verification needs in terms of weaponization activities would, would be, I think, much higher than in Iran's case, considering that it's widely known and accepted that Israel has nuclear weapons. And so the lesson, uh, some of the lessons from the JCPOA um, negotiations that might be applicable to the zone is, is to consider and to, to work out among states themselves and with the IEA about how much information is enough? How much assurance about past activities is enough? Uh, what do you make any uh, conclusions about past organization activities that were requisite for the zone to even go into effect? Uh, like it was partially the case with, with the JCPOA. Um, and, and that leads to the question about the requirements for the zone or zones entry into force, which was not uh, necessarily addressed in this essay series. Uh, but here you open a fairly big can of worms about what do you require in terms of clarification of past weaponization activities? Is that a prerequisite for entry into force? And, and how do you deal with, with uh, other requirements for entry into force of, of the zone? <clears throat> Moving to sort of a broader question of the, the structure of, the, uh, of, of negotiations, um, what came up already several times is the um, importance of pressures and incentives uh, for, the, for the negotiations and the conclusion of the JCPOA and Bo, Bo Beinhorn and Denis Vodiari talk about it. Um, and, and, and they emphasize that those pressures were important to get Iran to, to agree to certain limitations. And I, I would think that that lesson is not directly applicable necessarily to, to the zone because it would have to be quite different for the zone. Um, it's uh, the zones are required to be initiative coming from the, within the region. Uh, so, so it, and it has to be sort of arrangements arrived at freely by the state of the region concerned. And so the overwhelming role of an outside actor is not so necessarily so desirable in the zonal negotiation context as it was in, in the case of the JCPOA. Uh, ironically, though, this idea that powerful outside pressures and incentives are necessary uh, were exactly the things that the Arab states have traditionally sought and hoped for looking to, uh, to the United States in particular to bring Israel to the negotiating table. Um, that, I don't think that, that is, is uh, the winning approach in terms of getting the WMD free zone negotiated. Both Bob uh, Einhorn and Dines Fondiari also referenced the importance of the regional context. Again, this has come up already in the remarks uh, and uh, the, the impact of regional context and dynamics on both the negotiations themselves and the subsequent reaction implementation of the deal. Uh, Dina highlights that it was useful to compartmentalize the negotiations, right, to keep the broader regional concerns out of the JCPOA talks while keeping the key regional parties in point. So ultimately what worked for the deal is to prioritize nuclear. And Bob Einhorn underscores that keeping regional issues out of the JCPOA, uh, while useful for the talks themselves, has led to strong opposition mm -hmm. among the Republicans in the United States, and both also cite lack of provisions on regional security issues, 
uh, as one of the major reasons for we can support the agreement in different quarters, including very importantly in the region itself. On the one hand, the lesson for the zone seems to be fairly obvious, right? And it's connected to one of the main historical obstacles to beginning the negotiations of the zone, and that is the importance of addressing border security issues in, in the Middle East beyond nuclear, beyond WD. And prioritizing nuclear and WD issues is what the Arab states have traditionally argued for, uh, while arguing that the <clears throat> sort of more broader regional dynamics can be be addressed in parallel or, or separately should not should, certainly should not be a prerequisite for the negotiations. One lesson that I would like to draw and that wasn't necessarily that wasn't explicitly mentioned in the essays is actually for the regional actors to look at their experience with the JCPOA and how unsatisfying it was to not have their regional concerns addressed and apply that to their approach to the zone and think how they can facilitate a better engagement on both the nuclear and WMD and broader regional security issues, keeping in mind how unsatisfying for them it was to have nuclear prioritized at the expense of something that they might have considered to be more important for the regional dynamics. And finally, to, to sort of wrap up, the key difference for me between the JCPOA and the potential zone negotiations is that the JCPOA negotiations were definitely a concerted effort to solve a one country nuclear problem, right? Um, and with crucial involvement of outside actors, of great powers not located in the region. Whereas zonal negotiations, creation of any region or any zone is ultimately about forging a common regional vision of security and approach to, to nuclear weapons. And so I think that uh, it's important to draw uh, lessons from the JCPOA in some specific practical areas and see how they could be applicable once the zone, uh, WMD zone negotiations start. But I would advise against trying to sort of multilateralize the JCPOA as a route to the zone because at the heart of the approach to the two issues is at the heart, the approach to the two issues is, is different. Thank you. Thank you, Gafar, and um, many thought-provoking uh, points. Uh, I want to, just to mention that Gafar will have uh, to leave by 4.30 uh, Vienna or Geneva time, so uh, we will take questions for her first. So if uh, the Q&A right now chat is open, if you have a specific question to specific speaker, Please put it there, um, and we will take our questions first. But uh, first, let me turn to uh, our uh, last, but definitely not least, speaker, His Excellency Mr. Nabil Fahmi. Nabil was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt and currently serves as the Dean of School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. I'm especially delighted uh, that Nabil could join us today, since he also serves as our, on our project reference group. So with that, Nabil, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. <clears throat> Thank you all for inviting me back to this dialogue. You all know how interested I am in the topic. And when I see people trying to find answers, it's always a, a positive, uh, a little bit of an optimistic approach, although I, optimism only goes so far. Uh, I'd like to also welcome Dr. Dice to be, being here with us. It's interesting that so soon after he joins Unity, he, he jumps onto this uh, issue. The real test will be, will he come back to another session afterwards rather than simply this one. But anyway, you're most welcome. I'm going to go directly into the topics uh, and I'm cut, going to cut to the chase in many respects. Uh, the papers were interesting. The people writing them were very professional as, uh, as they're known. But as is, nobody's going to be surprised. I agree with some of the things and I completely disagree with some of the other things. So let me just simply shoot from the hip and allow this to be as useful as possible. First of all, the idea that the JCPOA would be a reference point or even a model to emulate is ridiculous. The JCP, JCPOA is much smaller than the zone per se. And if you want to, to compare it at all with anything, it would be not with the Middle East weapons-free zone. It would be with the Middle East nuclear weapons-free zone. That's where it would relate. Uh, uh, and even on that, it can't relate completely because, as you all said, 
size, nature, and so on and so forth. Now, again, I was never an enthusiastic supporter of JCPOA, but I was a strong critic of withdrawing from JCPOA uh, as well. I think JCPOA is useful, was useful, can be useful, uh, but is it the, uh, if you want, the key to the future of security in the Middle East, it can itself be a CBM. That's as far as I really look at the JCPOA uh, in terms of Middle Eastern security, in particular on nuclear weapons of mass destruction. Secondly, and uh, I'm glad that Gokar, as always, uh, hits the buttons. If we're going to have a zone, be that weapons of mass destruction, or be that nuclear, questions are, how far will Israel go? That's question one. Secondly, how far would Iran go? That's question two. And thirdly, if that's enough for the, all the other players in the region. Those are the issues. Everybody else, if you look from bottom up, everybody else is an NPT member. Iran, in spite of its membership, had problems in its nuclear program. Therefore, it raised concerns. Uh, that's why the JCPOA came into force. Israel is not a member. So the idea that the success or failure of a zone is a function of Iran's policy alone, or a function of what Arabs would accept, is frankly a false idea because the real test will be, how can we convince the Israelis to join a zone free of nuclear weapons, and then also other weapons of mass destruction. Now, my third point is, and I'm gonna blow my own horn on this. I'm the one who wrote the proposal on weapons of mass destruction in the, in the Middle East. So let me just explain it a little bit. It, doesn't, it never meant that we have to have one agreement for everything. It never actually meant that it all had to be region. If we could do either of the two, that would be great. But ultimately, it was always based on universal commitments and others with the objective of freeing the Middle East from all these weapon systems, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological. Now, how we did that could be a kaleidoscope of things, or it could be if we were all geniuses and had no motivation whatsoever, it could be by somebody writing up an agreement and we all signing. But I don't think you're going to bet on that uh, very much. So again, uh, you can't separate universal commitments from regional commitments. But given the nature of our region, there will have to be more regional activism to get wherever we're going to go. Uh, I'd like to also comment on a point made that uh, peace facilitates progress forward. I completely disagree with that. My country was the proponent of peace in the Middle East. But after we signed the peace agreement with Israel, they did not join the, the NPT. We did not get any closer to the zone, which we proposed with Iran back in 1974. So the fact that, and then we had breakouts actually be there in an Iraqi nuclear program, the Israeli program, the Iranian program, all after peace. So again, the idea that peace sort of helps achieving a zone, no, it doesn't with those who have acquired the weapon capacity. Uh, I would really focus that the real point, and this, this point was raised by the contributors, it is the balance of power dimension that factors in. Now, that's not going to work in favor of a zone in the region today. Therefore, where we need to what we need to instill is the universal component of balance of power, the universal norms towards non-proliferation, the universal diplomatic persuasion with the regions of the state to take a step forward towards these commitments. Because if we're simply going to say, uh, let's gang up five plus one against Iran and in the region do something similar, it doesn't exist and you're not going to get very far, be that with Israel or be that with, uh, with Iran. The, so it is extremely important to have an international dimension in the effort for the zone, although I completely agree with Gokar, uh, regional new thinking is also, I think, useful. And I've also always been a proponent of regional initiatives, be that on this issue or others. I would challenge also the comment that one of the mistakes of the past in the Middle East was all or nothing. It was never all or nothing. When was it all or nothing? 
the, the idea always was, let's try to commit to how far the Jewish community had moved, be there, and it was different paces, by the way, be that on nuclear, chemical, or biological. And then even Egypt, by the way, proposed to Israel in 1995, an incremental approach to their adherence to the NPT. So the idea that it was because we wanted to do the zone as a whole in one step, that's not correct. That was never the proposal. We made the proposal for weapons of mass destruction in response to Israeli concerns about chemical and biological weapons possibly being with the Arab countries. But we didn't even ask for that on the nuclear issue. So again, that's not the problem. The problem was not all or nothing. It was never proposed as uh, all or nothing. What's important, of course, is how do we generate the political will on all the sides? Because I believe if we ever achieve a zone, it's more complicated than the JCPOA, but it will be JCPOA plus be that on the nuclear issues or be that on the other issues. And it will have much more of a regional component than the JCPOA has presently. There was a comment also about, uh, I think it was Hela, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that JCPOA being smaller and smaller size was uh, useful, of course. I completely agree with it. It was, it's easier to negotiate when you have fewer parties. But the objective in the zone is larger. It's going to be more complicated. But I would also add that even within the JCPOA, by the way, the Iranians and Americans negotiated on the side alone. So even in a wider negotiations, you can have incremental, smaller, more limited negotiations leading up to wider agreements. And I would argue, and I know Bob, if, I, if he's with us here, uh, will agree with me on this. One of the issues we had during the acres process was the Iranians weren't there. So the idea that we could create a zone uh, in the absence of Iran, frankly, was not going to be acceptable to the, to the Israelis and besides many of the Arab Gulf states as well. So if we're talking about a region, you're talking about 22 plus states, Arabs, Iran, Israel, and some affiliation or relationship with, with other countries. Uh, the real problem uh, is we need to agree and find a way for all the states in the region to agree to a minimum that is required, and then to have additional steps to take into account the capacity that exists in some states versus others. Uh, ultimately, this package can apply to everybody, but what is in the NPT per se alone is not enough to cover states that already have nuclear capacity. Uh, and uh, so you're going to have to do actually two of these steps. Now, again, let me, I've always had, I've always admired Gokar, and let me pick on what she said, and frankly, what I've been talking about recently. I'm a strong proponent of a zone, and I'm not going to back off. This, is, this zone is going to start first by Israel being ready to negotiate, and then by dealing with Iran's capacity, and then everybody else having to work with them and, every, and the national community to move forward. But present day, you can't have that kind of negotiation. Some states recognize each other or aren't ready to engage each other. The balance of power doesn't exist to allow for that. And that's why you need a wider umbrella to embrace incremental steps. And what I mean by wider is, uh, on the one hand, we're looking at areas that relate to a wider region. Uh, I would go to things like the Security Council, IEA, CWC, whatever, uh, or even trying to develop a negotiating process under the, uh, the Security Council where each one of us could come in and bring in our ideas under which we could then have what I would call directed incremental incrementalization. In other words, let's agree on the objective. Do we want to free the Middle East from weapons of mass destruction as a whole? If we agree to that, 
and establish that as our ultimate goal. We should then be able to sit down together and say, okay, how, what do we need to create to develop a process to get there? And that involves CBMs, but also concrete measures and concrete negotiations on what kind of uh, limitations and verification and so on. So let me quickly jump into these things and I won't take too much of, more of your time. As I said, JCPOA plus would be the bare minimum for the nuclear component of this. I can't imagine less than that. It simply would not work. Uh, whatever Iran was to accept today in JCPOA plus, why in the world should it accept that Israel do less than that? Even if others would do that. And I can, as was said, Israel's capacity is higher than Iran's capacity. Secondly, I definitely would believe the zone has to be indefinite in length. Be that a multi, again, it can be a series of agreements creating a zone that is free of all these weapons. It doesn't have to be one agreement, but they would have to be indefinite length. Uh, thirdly, I would look at the nuclear component as being a component of weapons of mass destruction zone. It doesn't have to be the first step, but it definitely would have to be in parallel to getting there. Uh, I would learn from the technical issues at, raised at JCPOA, but I would also argue that there's a lot to learn from IEA, CWC, and BWC as CBMs, even before, I mean, you, many of you have heard me say before, Egypt won't join uh, any of these agreements if Israel doesn't join the NPT. But there's something we can learn in terms of CBMs to move forward. Uh, we need to have an agreed goal, even if the specificity of how to get there and the detail is still uh, not completely there. And we need to find a way to bridge between the concern that if you start negotiations, you get into a slippery slope of ultimate negotiations. And the other concern is that if you look at incrementalism too long, it ends into ultimate uh, endless negotiations without getting anywhere. Uh, therefore, I'd like to close by mentioning something I've mentioned recently, which by the way, I've been criticized uh, domestically uh, quite energetically about, domestic is the wrong word, regionally, quite energetically about. I think priority should be given to nuclear issues and we should start with the nuclear zone. But I don't see that being convinced. I don't see others being convinced by that, particularly the Israelis uh, in the short term and possibly even the Iranians. Therefore, how do we deal with the regional concerns of other states without watering down our own priority issues. And again, that's the reason why we changed our nuclear proposal to a weapons of mass destruction proposal, or we expanded it. Uh, I would argue that the Middle East is changing. We still don't have peace, but the Middle East is changing. It's becoming actually more problematic even, even now. But I would like to start discussing a new Middle Eastern security architecture. We're not going to agree on it at the beginning, but I'd like to look at how can we deal with each other on security measures in the future if different components are fulfilled. One pillar of that architecture would have to be arms control and disarmament. Uh, and to get there, you need to have a series of steps um, that indicate a level of seriousness. Now, the second step would be to put into place a set of regional guidelines of how states in the region uh, should operate to deal with regional concerns, to deal with crisis issues, how do you deal with good neighborly relations concerns, uh, and so on and so forth, even if you can't yet get into full normalization at this stage. So you'd have a hardcore arms control pillar, and you have a soft core security pillar at the same time. Uh, the dialogue recently that was held between uh, Dr. Musavian and Dr. El-Sagar, I think was 
a good beginning and there are room, there are indications that there are other talks as well. But uh, we need to do more of that. And to give people the cover to do that, we need to look at a larger context. Now, let's not ignore our own experiences. At the ACRES process, we actually developed a draft declaration on region security for the whole region. It failed at the very end for a problem on two issues in particular, but there's a document there that deals with how the region states should deal with each other. It's not adoptable now for political reasons, but it provides a lot of material that people can work with. And I would argue that the security component of um, the OSCE process has also lessons there. We can't emulate them identically, but there's room to deal with this. So I would love to have a regional dialogue under, again, the Security Council with getting the regional states in a special group to discuss arms control on the one hand, region security issues on the other hand, and how can we work in parallel on both of these issues and then ultimately try to merge them. But uh, the, it's not a situation, frankly, where uh, JCPOA is the solution to the Middle Eastern problem, but I also don't agree with, with others who argue that the JCPOA does not have any lessons to learn from. So I would do both. But again, the zone issue is the larger issue. And if you want to deal with it seriously, it's not about the technical issues. It's about the political will. Do the Israelis first, do the Iranians second, and then do the other Arab, other states in the region. Are they all ready to commit to prohibitions and verification and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil, for taking us uh, through tour the zone of uh, the both uh, the zone concept and the idea. And I want just to mention that the DOP, the Declaration of Principle that uh, Nabil mentioned uh, that was working during Acres and the draft itself uh, is also in the document depository. So if anyone uh, trying to learn from the past and then abhor some ideas, that's another uh, place to go and check. So right now, I, I know I have many questions to all our speakers, but uh, for the sake of time, I will uh, give our audience the opportunity to ask question. And then I will, uh, if there will not be any questions, I then I will jump in and ask my own question. So with that, um, let me uh, ask you, Farzan, uh, since you were the first speaker. So in your specific essay uh, with uh, Professor Malout, you, you spoke about the enforcement measure. And I think, uh, especially Nabil, uh, pointed out the need, for example, for Security Council uh, umbrella. In your, uh, in your essay, one of the thinking was that actually the JCPOA mechanism, uh, the snapback mechanism, actually had some important aspects of deterrence as well as facilitation of uh, a dialogue, but also a fail actually because the, the bar was very, very high. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about what your conclusion from the JCPOA and, how, and what some of your recommendation related to um, enforcement uh, as regard to the zone? Yeah, that's right. Um, so one of the things we found is obviously uh, something that's been already mentioned by some of the speakers, including Mark, is the asymmetry in terms of enforcement me mechanisms. So there was an enforcement mechanism, namely snapback, that was contemplated in the case of the Islamic Republic, but not in the case of another participant. And when you actually speak to negotiators who uh, formulated the JSPOA, it really appears that they never contemplated the possibility of U.S. withdrawal or serious U.S. Viol violations of the deal which is a pretty major oversight. And so moving for obviously in a zone context where there isn't the same power disparities, that's not gonna be the case. Another issue with the uh, snapback was that we can see that there's a very high threshold for its implementation. So in the deals, Iran specifically says that if, it, if snapback is used, Iran reserves the right to stop uh, implementing its own, its own um, commitments under, under the agreement. Uh, and so th that's also a determinant for the use uh, of snapback. So you really have to get to a very high level of like the ceasing of the implementation of uh, commitments before that can be used. Otherwise, uh, you might be shooting yourself in the foot. And so uh, it, it, we, we contemplate a number of different mechanisms um, that 
the regional states can use drawing from this experience uh, and you can read it in detail in the actual essay. But the gist of it is that you, you, can, you have options both for enforcement mechanisms at an international level, namely the UN Security Council, but also from a zone kind of um, a zone body, um, basically responsible for implementation uh, of the deal. And there you, you can actually have graded, graded sanctions or kind of uh, sticks uh, in, or you know, sources of pressure to address potential, potential violations. And these, this can range from diplomatic censure to you know, let, let's say very narrow sanctions targeting individuals um, who are violating those sanctions and so forth, so on all the way up to uh, potentially much more large scale economic, uh, political and, and, and security measures there. Although we also say that part of the underlying assumption of some of these sanctions would be that we're at a stage where there's much better relations um, as well as kind of economic ties specifically between states. And that, that's a big one, right, moving forward. That's why I think in, in my talk, and I think this goes to uh, His Excellency Turk El Faisal's, uh, Red Turk El Faisal's comment that he made, uh, that what do you do in the absence of pressure? And uh, I, I think specifically um, in the area of, I think research uh, has, um, I, I think we know from historical experience that there are many economic benefits that can be derived from process of regionalization and regional integration institution building. And I think uh, there can thus be more uh, examination of that possibility. Of course, there's the example of what's happened with the European Union, but we see also echoes of this in the Asia position and Latin America that fall, behind, fall under the threshold of this large scale integration project of the EU. Uh, so I think we're currently in the process of researching what incentives could be there could be for joining a zone that would be positive inducements rather than coercive or negative ones. And my colleague Kamisha Bino is heading that initiative, and so we'll we'll have uh, the kind of results of that uh, in in the coming months. And I think there'll be some interesting insights there. Thank you. Thank you, Farsan. And, and that's actually an excellent segment since uh, His Royal Excellency Turkey El Faisal is one of the authors of that uh, incentive uh, essay collection. So with that, uh, His Royal Excellency, will you want uh, to ask the question uh, that you had? If I and may, thank you for having me today. And hello to everybody. Uh, Mark's uh, uh, statement about uh, assurances to Israel uh, that no one else is cheating. Uh, I think that should work for everybody, not just for Israel. Uh, after all, yani Israel is the first cheater, if I may say, uh, in this whole process by how it acquired its nuclear arsenal. So the assurances have to be broader and not just take into account uh, Israeli sensitivities. And as far as, as the, uh, the enforcement, uh, it's going to be very difficult to find a mechanism to implement whatever agreement is, even if the snapback, as you said, Farzan, the Iranians' response to that was, well, well we're going to go on and develop our nuclear weapon. So it, it's a matter of, of, of almost blackmail that you allow for any country uh, if we, we apply uh, economic sanctions or any other sanctions, then uh, we're going to go ahead and, and do that. So I, I'm not sure where, what I recommended, of course, is that there should be, uh, if you like, like Nabil said, an overarching umbrella, which is the United Nations Security Council, P plus five, guaranteeing the whole process and guarantees of, of economic incentives to join the, the, the zone uh, and sanctions uh, and not just to rely on economic sanctions, but also to have opened the door for, for military sanction as well. I know that might not be popular with some, some, uh, some uh, people today in, in, in the world, but I just don't see how someone can, can in a zone that is so full of, of suspicion and long history of animosity uh, that you can have uh, goodwill as, as a means of guaranteeing any meaningful result. And therefore, uh, having a regional security apparatus, as Nabil mentioned, is equally important uh, to 
guarantee that the, the, the sensitivities of countries and the differences that they have with each other can be discussed in the meantime as the zone is being formed. So that uh, whether it is Palestine, whether it is Yemen, whether it is, I don't know, Iraq, Syria, you name it, uh, it can be, it can carry on at the same time as we're developing the zone. And it's not a matter of, uh, as also Nabil mentioned, it's not uh, everything or nothing. Uh, it's, it's a progressive, uh, I would consider maybe generational uh, process uh, to go and achieve the zone if we have targets for it and can perhaps through diplomacy and through economic incentives and so on, uh, bring some sort of uh, agreement or, or principles of agreement between the 22 plus, I don't know, four or five that Nabil mentioned. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, Gaukar, you wanted also to comment about enforcement, and then I will uh, ask uh, the question that Ayman uh, was trying to ask. I know that he had uh, some connection issues. So with that, uh, Gaukar, if you want to address the issue of enforcement, and I don't know if uh, both Nabil and Mark, you would like to do it as well before we move into the next question. I can hold off if you want to rather as well. No, no, that's okay. okay. Uh, the, the question of enforcement, I think, is, is difficult, not just in, with respect to the zone. I think it's enforcement is difficult for all of the multilateral non-proliferation arms control agreements. So, so it's not surprising, right, that we don't have a particularly good solution for the zone. That said, I think considering how much time we, we talk about enforcement and what kind of means come up as, as necessary for enforcement with regard to the Middle East zone really highlights how much of a different animal it is right now from any other regional zone that we have. Because if you have, if you look at the nuclear weapon free zones in other regions, uh, they, they, mo they mostly emphasize kind of peaceful resolution of disputes through arbitration, uh, you can go through the regional body, et cetera. And I think that again reflects how the process of creating a zone usually is about states coming together and actually creating trust. Uh, they're working on the basis of a trust that's already there a lot of times and then and then building that, that kind of trust. So they don't feel like they need a, um, this, this hanging sort of an outside actor all that much. Uh, and when we switch to discussion of the Middle East zone, it's it's like we're discussing some hardcore arms control agreement rather than sort of this kind of regional um, confidence building and security arrangement. And that just I think that just highlights how how different the challenge is at the moment from from any other existing regional arrangement. Thank you, Mark. If you want to comment on the enforcement, so I'd prefer time. to wait until Ayman's question is posed. Okay. Uh, Nabil, do you want to discuss the enforcement now or later on? I'll also, well, let me actually do that now. Uh, now you have an optimistic, uh, more cooperative angle than, than, uh, than previously. You know, the enforcement issue is extremely important. It will have to be part of an agreement. But in all honesty, if we get as far as having an agreement, I don't think this will be the problem because the process of getting to an agreement will involve such an in intensive and extensive discussion uh, of the requirements and uh, reflection domestically about what can and what cannot be done. Uh, I would look more at, if you want, graduated enforcement mechanisms. Some things which could be dealt with regionally, some things which need to be dealt with uh, internationally. I would define violations uh, differently between minor violations and more significant violations. But in all honesty, again, I honestly believe we, will, we can reach an agreement on enforcement if we get as far as defining the prohibitions, explaining the verification procedures. Uh, so that's a long way down. I, I wouldn't get uh, hung up on enforcement at this point. Thank you. And, and I think that that's an interesting comment in the sense that the assumption, because the, although the JCPOA has been negotiated for many, many years and didn't really build the trust that was hopeful, and, and the assumption was that the trust will, will happen as a result, 
I think your comment, uh, Nabil, is that some of that trust will be built as a result of the negotiation and, and not necessarily will resolve everything, but I think um, that's sort of an, another aspect that's important to, to understand or to think about. Well, let, let me just jump in for a second. Not saying it shouldn't have enforcement mechanisms. Quite the contrary. I think once we have an agreement, there has to be an enforcement mechanism. All I was saying is that if we can resolve all the other issues, I feel there will be enough of a common interest in ensuring that there are enforcement mechanisms so that no one violates. That. That's all I'm saying. We will need enforcement mechanisms. And I would argue in the nature of the Middle East, we'll probably have to have some international. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. Uh, next, I have uh, Bassam, Bassam Passam from the Egyptian mission in New York. Uh, thank you very much for joining me here. Um, again, another very uh, interesting discussion, and we highly appreciate this effort under this particular project. Um, I, I posted a, a question in the chat. I wasn't expecting to be given the floor, uh, but nevertheless, of course, uh, the very insightful remarks by Minister Fahmi uh, uh, made my job much easier. I, I think he put things in the right context. The common um, theme or underlying logic that I find in many of those uh, interesting and useful uh, essays um, is that um, we see um, a gradual uh, involvement of, of the discussion from focusing on the elimination of weapons to the elimination of um, uh, dual use technologies. Uh, and, and that I think is something that is unprecedented. It was never the underlying logic in any of the uh, uh, zone, existing zones or any of the global instruments in this domain. Um, furthermore, I, I think um, the JCPOA, of course, is a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, uh, international agreement, but we need to take into account uh, the um, uh, circumstances that surrounded reaching uh, that agreement, the background against which the Iranian nuclear dossier was brought up. Uh, there were specific concerns about possible military dimensions um, leading to uh, measures taken by the Security Council and sanctions being imposed and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think we need to take that into um, account when we address a regional uh, arrangement. Um, furthermore, um, in my view, um, the essays, for example, when they touch on trying to learn from the DCPOA uh, uh, agreement when it comes to the negotiation process, when it comes to the verification arrangements, um, there seems to be um, somewhat undermining or ignoring the fact that there are existing processes, or existing organizations. Um, um, there is a conference uh, that uh, all countries of the region are invited to participate in. Of course, the possibility of having bilateral uh, uh, discussions on the margins, uh, uh, the possibility is there and it actually happened uh, during the first session. Um, um, so I, I just wanted to highlight uh, that sometimes uh, when we read um, these uh, valid analysis, we get the feeling that um, there is a tendency to reinvent the wheel and to undermine uh, the fact that there are existing organizations and institutional structures that can address uh, uh, these topics. And they, they should be at least referred to in, in the analysis that uh, there is a process, there are organizations, and, and uh, this can be taken into account as a valid option at least, but I, I get the feeling in some essays that um, let's try to uh, invent something new and um, totally disregard uh, those existing mechanisms. Thank you very much. I wasn't prepared to take the floor, but uh, uh, we wish you all success and we highly appreciate this valuable effort by you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Bastam. So uh, the question of Ayman was, um, Mark, uh, you're a good friend. He talks about assurances that we can provide to Israel to ensure no one is cheating. Looking at this from a different angle, what assurances can Israel provide to its neighbor that is not cheating and that is not going to target other Arab countries? Okay, good. Well, so Eamon's question is, is basically um, in line with uh, His Excellency al Faisal said that um, any uh, of the verification arrangements have to be universal. Of course, that's that's uh, uh, certainly the case. So I don't mean to suggest that uh, non-Israeli states in the Middle East have to do things that are not applicable to Israel. I, the reason I 
I, had, I put this in terms of the assurances that Israel will need, because I agree with Ambassador Nabu Fami. I always call him ambassador. I know he has many titles, but uh, that's how I knew him. When he says that Israel is the first issue, uh, you know, persuading Israel to give up its uh, uh, nuclear weapons is, is the biggest hurdle. So how to do that will require um, it to feel uh, safe and that its neighbors are not violating. And if I just may, may, may make one uh, small point on uh, His Excellency al Faisal's uh, uh, statement that Israel was the, he, in, in his words, he said the first cheater. And yes, Israel acquired uh, heavy water and HEU um, from the United States uh, through uh, illicit means. But, you know, there are many, there are four states in, in the Middle East after that that did violate their NPT commitments. Uh, and, uh, and, and Israel uh, can recite chapter and verse of all of that, of course. Thank you, thank you, Mark. And let me just thank again uh, Gaukar. Gaukar will have to leave now. We will uh, now turn to Mr. El Abadi. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this issue of the nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East, since almost 17 years ago, that the Joint Foreign Office was one of the main issues that we worked on that. And now, I uh, assume that in several times, we are proposing some projects to deviate the focus from the main issue. First, I remember that it was a start from the, the putting aside, the, there was a proposal to the nuclear free zone and middle and uh, weapons of mass destructions and their delivery means. And there, the, then there was a proposal to create a Persian Gulf nuclear weapon, weapon free zone then there was a proposal on creating a region free of enrichment and now to put JCPOA as a model uh, on this respect. But I think all of this proposal is somehow deviating our all focus on the main issues. As our colleague Boston from New York clearly mentions that now we are uh, uh, actually getting for from eliminating the nuclear weapons to some, somehow limiting uh, technologies and dual use technologies and equipment. The main issue of the JCPOA was to actually address uh, trust deficit or some sort of um, uh, a fabricated crisis that after three years of negotiation it was proved when the administration changed, again, they uh, back to the, the, the first step and put aside the whole JC, JCPOA. JCPOA has quite time-bound uh, obligations that many of these obligations already exist within the, uh, uh, and uh, for example, under the, at the safeguard agreements, additional protocol, or at the end of the day to giving a broader conclusion to Iran uh, by the IA in order to put a sunset to the uh, J, J, JCPOA. But, uh, we, I don't think that losing a focus on eliminating nuclear weapons in the region could serve for the purpose of the clear, creating nuclear weapon prison in the, in the Middle East. We have already, because we, do not, we don't actually work in the vacuum, there are several regions has been already established. The definition and the term, terms of reference are clear. We have Article 7 of the MPT, 1995 resolutions, and decision in 2000, 2010 decisions to uh, actually have a conference on that. Mr. Madi, your connection is very bad, and we, we, we heard most of what you said until now, besides of the last two sentences. So if uh, I don't know if there is any questions that you want to ask our speakers while well, we can hear you still. We will, we will try to get uh, the question maybe offline and communicate that. So in the meantime, um, what I have, I have next as uh, a question is Ambassador Shimon Stein. Thanks, Chen. Uh, it's kind of a question, also a comment. Uh, I, uh, which is not uh, that often, I find myself in agreement with Nabil uh, concerning the uh, value of the uh, JCPOA uh, and related to the uh, WD uh, uh, free zone. Let me make a, a simply a banal statement saying that uh, I think that you can always learn something from uh, 
anything, uh, lessons are always good that can be uh, drawn from certain processes that uh, happens uh, in the realm of uh, disarmament and arms control. But I uh, think that the JCPOA at the end of the day, because of the points that Nabil has uh, made, uh, cannot serve as a, as a model. I'll take issue with uh, uh, Nabil on some of his remarks, but let me first turn to uh, Mark and the points that he has uh, made regarding uh, the six takeaways uh, that you took, Mark, from the JCPOA. And starting with the uh, notion uh, that uh, the JCPOA can serve as a disincentive uh, for countries in the region. I think that, first of all, the jury with respect to the future of the JCPOA is still out. I don't know, perhaps you know a bit more than I do about the possible outcome of the negotiations that are currently taking place in Vienna. Uh, but from what I hear, from what I read, I would argue that uh, if that uh, what I hear is going to happen, it will be a disincentive for the region uh, for quite a number of uh, uh, reasons. Uh, uh, among them, uh, I think that uh, there is one critical subject uh, uh, that uh, has to do with the breakout time, for example. The notion was that uh, we will have a one year breakout time, uh, but now given the progress that Iran has made on research and development and developing new uh, centrifuge, the whole notion of a, a year breakout time has become really meaningless because given the technology and the advancement, we will end up uh, in a breakout time, which at best would be of three or four months. That is uh, the first item. Secondly, uh, Gukar has a uh, new as well, have related to uh, the past activities and the famous section T. I think that the whole way that section T and the uh, past activities were dealt within the original JCPOA doesn't serve to uh, bring confidence and trust of the parties because the uh, participants uh, chose simply uh, in a way to uh, overcome that problematic sanction T because of uh, some objections by uh, some of the uh, participants within the uh, 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 P5 uh, plus, uh, plus one. So uh, I don't want to uh, continue about it, but only to say that uh, we may find ourselves that the JCPOA will serve as a disincentive for countries in the region rather than an incentive. Uh, we'll have to uh, wait and see, but that's my feeling. With respect to the uh, comments that uh, Nabil has uh, uh, made, uh, I think Nabil, uh, I know that uh, I know uh, basically your uh, approach, but not only generally speaking about uh, uh, universal, about international versus uh, regional, but an obstacle, I fully agree with you that the region need and rather urgently a, a forum to discuss uh, the security architecture. It has been long overdue and I think that uh, we have discussed it, many others have discussed it, and fact of the matter that it hasn't happened so far. And I think that the problem is not because we lack an umbrella. You uh, refer to the Security Council as a possible umbrella for such uh, discussions, which will be separated into the regional and arms control. We can discuss the modalities of, su of how such a conference would look like, but uh, the fact that it hasn't happened so far has nothing to do with the fact that we are lacking an, uh, an umbrella. And uh, mind you, we were both at the uh, ACRES meetings and they were held not under a, U uh, under a, a UN umbrella, but uh, under the umbrella of the United States and uh, uh, Russia. And I think that that was uh, a good uh, 
decision. We may end the, now also China and possibly the EU, but I don't see the lack of an umbrella, the, the obstacle for the fact that countries in the region are unwilling to engage currently uh, in such a gathering, which will have to, as you said, and I will go along with you, which will have to be inclusive in terms of participants and comprehensive in terms of the agenda. So it's no subject should be excluded or be treated in a gradual process. I think that we can deal with all subjects at the, at the, the same time. You said also that uh, uh, peace uh, is not sufficient uh, or is not an incentive. And you brought uh, Egypt, Israel as an example to prove that peace is not enough. Yes, peace is not enough, but peace is uh, one of the prerequisites for uh, moving uh, forward. And we have not, uh, we are not yet at that, at that point, but clearly only peace without other elements, I think might, uh, uh, might uh, at least uh, at this stage uh, uh, be a problem. Uh, and uh, I don't frankly find the problem of adhering to a universal set of guidelines that problematic. I will go along with you, but we have also a, a kind of a differences of opinion, some would say ideological, which uh, haven't changed that much during the uh, uh, during uh, the time since we uh, convened the uh, beginning of the 90s uh, with respect to Israel primarily regional approach and not global approach, uh, the need for uh, regional agreements and wherever possible also complement them by universal also uh, agreements, but not the other way around, which I find uh, and still continue to find uh, a bit difficult. That will do it, Ken, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Shimon. Uh, let me give uh, both Nabil and Mark the opportunity to uh, answer some of the questions that were uh, asked so far before we are moving to uh, our next uh, set of questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your patience. Well, again, this has been an interesting discussion. I wasn't ever, ever saying that the absence of an umbrella uh, was why we didn't succeed in the past. Uh, what I was saying basically uh, is that we couldn't succeed in the past because we couldn't find a way, I thought from our perspective as, as Egypt or as an Arab country, uh, at the time we were not really talking about Iran per se. The discussion was on the nuclear issue. How do we deal with the, uh, with the nuclear issue? Uh, Israel wasn't ready to deal with the nuclear issue uh, then. It was ready to discuss regional security, which we did also at, at Acres. But the, the reason that declaration failed was on two issues. Israel refused to add the nuclear issue to the declaration and refused to, to specifically say that the Palestinians had the right self-determination. But again, what I'm saying today is in today's reality, I don't expect us to be able to develop a forum in the short term that is completely regional. Therefore, I'm trying to find a wider forum with the least possible political weight, sorry, baggage, which will allow us to have a discussion. And the UN context is that, that more natural forum. It, we can then have from that umbrella a more specialized debate. And I would add again, uh, my priority always is whether you have a conflict or a peace, it's better to bring down the threshold of violence, in other words, particularly on weapons, to a lower threshold. But I accept the fact that uh, let's also discuss the other issues which are not purely disarmament. So my suggestion isn't either or, it's simply let's do both of these. But in all, and, and I say this with all due respect, and Shimon and I go back a long way, we've had numerous interesting discussions, but I say this with, with all due respect. Uh, Let's agree on the goal and we can find the forum. If we disagree on the goal, the forum is, is, is a waste of time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nobel. Um, Mark? Yes, uh, Shimon makes uh, uh, valid points about uh, how this deal 
uh, has imperfections that uh, lead other states, particularly Saudi Arabia, uh, to uh, not feel fully satisfied. The way I look at it, though, is not in terms of uh, this imperfect deal versus a what might be regarded as a perfect deal uh, from Saudi's perspective or Israel's or Washington's, but rather this deal as opposed to what would be the case if we had no deal at all. And if we had no deal at all, we think back to 2012, Iran was marching toward getting a nuclear weapons capability pretty quickly. And, uh, and in the last year, it's uh, resumed that activity. So for God's sake, at least a deal that uh, limits it and that includes the verification measures do give Saudi Arabia more incentive than would be the case if there were no deal at all. So that's, that's my answer on that. As for the, um, the way in which um, uh, Section T and um, the past nuclear activities issue was dealt with, I agree, this is very imperfect. I, I criticized uh, this uh, last part particularly, but you know, to be a bit um, mischievous, I might think that Israel might find some solace in the way that the uh, past military dimensions issue was dealt with. Because how on earth is Israel going to agree under a WMD free zone to have uh, everything that it did in the past uh, exhumed and laid out and inspected? It might find that the way that uh, Iran was able to give imperfect answers to the past military dimensions issue might be more satisfactory than a complete uh, investigation. So the question that he asked is, I understand that the JCPOA is applied to Iran only. How effective it can have an impact on the Middle East weapon of mass destruction free zone and ensure the international community on peaceful use of nuclear energy in that region? So let me start uh, with you, Mark, and then we'll ask you, Nabil, to comment on that. And especially, Nabil, I think um, the question uh, referred to your idea of JCPOA plus. So I think what is the plus that will ensure uh, international community on peaceful, useful application, but more. Well, yeah, um, just to summarize very quickly, you know, I laid out um, what I thought were six ways in which the JCPOA can be applicable to the Middle East. Some of the specific uh, items that were included, like Section T, like um, the, uh, the most modern uh, verification methods being the norm, all of those are very applicable to a, a, a zone concept. Uh, but you also asked specifically about nuclear energy, uh, Mr. Eric, and uh, you know, I think it's important that the JCPOA did, uh, did recognize and, and promote um, uh, Iranian um, development of nuclear energy and applied safety standards to that. So the zone might also incorporate some of the safety measures, you know, the norms of internet of safety conventions and, uh, and, and nuclear security uh, norms. Great question. It's important to take into account here that whether it is with regards to the scope of prohibition, the content of the prohibition, or the verification procedures, or for that matter, even the sanctions procedures, if there's a violation. Given the, uh, I think what Prince Turki mentioned, the level of, of, of lack of confidence and uh, adversary in the Middle East, given what it, that exists today, we will have to do, we will have to agree on more than what exists in universal agreements in all those aspects. Uh, therefore, this may, uh, I'm not suggesting that we should go universal versus region. All I'm suggesting is that I want to go regional, but to go regional, we're going to have to agree on more than what is in universal. And what's in universal already includes elements on the peaceful use of nuclear energy, chemical weapons, uh, uh, BW, and so on and so forth. So if we were to commit as states to a zone, I don't see why any of us would not also want to also commit to the universal agreements on that particular subject, which have fewer obligations, but all have clear components to ensure peaceful use. So I'm not really worried about the peaceful use component uh, if we were to reach a zone. And what I, I have to really run, but I, what I'd really like to see to get this process started one way or the other is a simple declaration from all the states in the region saying we want to free the Middle East from all weapons of mass destruction in that language. So it's creating a Middle East that's free from those kinds of weapons, nuclear, chemical, biological, uh, 
once we make that commitment, how we do that through a regional package, a regional all-encompassing treaty, or a series of universal and regional treaties is a negotiating process. And I'd love to see the international community, Security Council in particular, endorse that common objective by the regional states, and then either provide us an umbrella or somebody else come up with a more interesting idea so that we can discuss both uh, weapons issues and uh, security issues uh, towards an, an agreed goal, but that is also commensurate with the kinds of uh, insecurity and tensions and suspicions that exist uh, in the region uh, today. Uh, because frankly, I hate to say this, but having been doing this for a long time, uh, I'm getting more suspicious about the commitment of the regional states to the goal than I was when we started. When we started, I felt it was the process that was a problem. Now I'm getting the impression that actually it may be the goal that's the problem. And therefore a discussion on modalities or this or that is, is really senseless. But I, I, I'm sorry, but I really have to, to run. Uh, this was a great discussion. I uh, hope what I said was useful and I hope to see you, including the head of Unidir again at these sessions. Thank you, bye-bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nabil. Let me first thanks uh, all you participants that have been with us uh, on in this complex, not one, but two Middle Eastern issues, both the JCPOA and the Middle East Weapon of Mass Destruction Free Zone. And uh, the, the essays, all the essays are available right now online, including um, the video recording of the meeting will be also available uh, shortly. Uh, I want to make a specific thank you uh, to three people that made this entire in technical endeavor possible. Uh, Anlor, Tom Hickey, and uh, Leticia Zaran that uh, have been amazing helping us uh, through the technology and through the event logistics. So uh, I will ask last uh, if you will be uh, able to share with us the feedback. Uh, there is a survey to the right in the chat box uh, with some uh, suggestion as well, suggestions that you would like to see in future events, as well as what you found uh, most productive and helpful in this event. So the link is in the chat box, please uh, do help us get better. And, and with that, Mark, let me thank you specifically uh, for staying with us and uh, representing by now all speakers. So with that, goodbye, everyone. Have a very good rest of the day. Goodbye.